and all it contains were formed by the hands of our God. Glory, Glory and praise to the Creator of all. Welcome to worship this day. We're glad you are with us. Um, we're excited that today will be our first um, coffee time together. Um, my first time with you and your first time with each other in a very long time. So I'm going to welcome um, to head downstairs at the conclusion of the service. Worship. I'm Reverend Francis Luke, and my pronouns are she and her. And we acknowledge with gratitude the traditional territories of our Indigenous and Métis neighbors and their hospitality. We offer our respect and commitment to living into right relationship with all our relations. At this time, we'll have a lady of Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
But Zacchaeus, well, well Jesus, Jesus, had a plan. He climbed the sycamore tree. There were lots of them in Jericho. <laughs> when Zacchaeus, well, well Jesus, Jesus, was up the tree, he could see Jesus. You are loved over the crowds. And as Jesus, you are loved, walked through the crowds, that lined the streets of Jericho. <laughs> he looked up and saw Zacchaeus. Welcome, Jesus! And he said to Zacchaeus, Welcome, Jesus! I am coming to your house for supper today. The crowd was shocked that Jesus, you are loved, would go and eat with a tax collector. Ooh. And this the crowd left the streets of Jericho and went home. Zacchaeus, welcome Jesus, got down out of the tree and made his way to his house in Jericho to get ready for Jesus. You are loved. The crowds did not like Zacchaeus. Welcome, Jesus, because he was a tax collector. But Zacchaeus, welcome, Jesus, had a wonderful meal made for Jesus. You are loved and his friends. Jesus, you are loved, told lots of stories at supper, promising Zacchaeus, welcome, Jesus, that God loved him, even though he was a tax collector. That he should not listen to the crowd. <laughs> Zacchaeus, welcome Jesus, was so happy with what Jesus, you are loved, was telling him that Zacchaeus, welcome Jesus, said, I'm going to change how I am a tax collector. I am not going to take more money from the crowd than I should. And I'm going to return any extra money I took from them in the past. Jesus, you are loved, was so happy with what Zacchaeus, welcome Jesus, told him. He said, you are forgiven for your past mistakes. God loves you. The next day, when Jesus, you are loved, and his friends left Jericho, do you, Zacchaeus, the tax collector started to visit the crowd and do just what he told Jesus. You are loved. He would do, giving their money back to them. Everyone in Jericho was changed by Jesus. You are loved, but no one more than Zacchaeus. Welcome, Jesus. Good job.
your peace. And together may we be the peace of Christ for one another. We are invited to share the peace of Christ. I think we're just going to still stay seated and watch it. We are invited to lift up prayers to God in this time, bringing our whole selves to God, the good, the bad, the ugly, trusting that God's grace in Jesus meets us where we are at and brings us to deeper hope. Let us offer our prayers. Friends, let us pray. God of goodness and grace, we are before you in prayer. A gathering of people who live with such an abundance of faithfulness and care. Yet we also acknowledge that each of us carries burdens from heartbreak and struggle, regrets about mistakes and missteps, words and acts we wish we could take back, and some we wish we had dared to share. As we risk honesty of heart and life, we trust in your love, which both celebrates our goodness and heals our broken places, strengthening us to be the people and the church who created us to be. In Jesus, our model and comfort, and the Spirit, our guide and stay, we pray this day. Amen. Friends, we are reminded by Jesus that when we present ourselves honestly before God, our hearts will be healed and our lives will move towards gold. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May these words mingle in our hearts with the Spirit's wisdom to become your word of life and hope. This we pray in Jesus' name. The first reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, Joel, chapter 2, verses 23 to 29. People of Zion, shout with joy and happiness in the eternal your God. The drought is over. Who has sent the early autumn rain as a sign of faithfulness? Who has poured down rain, autumn and spring as before? The threshing floors will be covered in grain, the vats will spill over with new wine and fresh oil. The Eternal says, I will compensate you for the years that the locusts have eaten, the swarming locusts, the creeping locusts, the stripping locusts, and the cutting locusts that was unleashed against you. In that day you will eat plenty of food and always have enough, and you will praise my name. The Eternal One, your God, who is merciful to you, never again will my people be shamed among the nations. Return to me, and you will know that I live among my people Israel, and that I, the Eternal One, am your God, and there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed among the nations. Then in those days I will pour my spirit to all humanity. Your children will boldly and prophetically speak the word of God. Your elders will dream dreams. Your young ones will see visions. No one will be left out. In those days I will offer my spirit all servants, both male and female. This is the witness of Israel. Amen. <clears throat> Second reading from the Gospel, Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. He told another parable, this one addressed to people who were confident in their self-righteousness and looked down on other people with disgust. Imagine two people walking up the road, going to the temple to pray. One of them is a Pharisee, and the other is a despised tax collector. Once inside the temple, the Pharisee stands up, 
and praise his prayer in honour of himself. God, how I thank you that I am not on the same level as other people, crooks, cheaters, the immortal, like this tax collector over here. Just look at me. I fast not once, but twice a week, and I faithfully pay my tithes on every penny of income. Over in the corner, the tax collector begins to pray, but he won't even lift his eyes to heaven. <coughs> he pounds on his chest in sorrow and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now imagine these two people walking back down the road to their homes. Listen, it's the tax collector who walks home justified, made right with God and not the Pharisee, because whoever lifts himself up will be put down, and whoever takes a humble place will be lifted up. This is the good news of Jesus. Thanks be God. Friends, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Two folks went to a church to offer prayers to God. The first one, a long-standing church member, and the second one, a scammer. The church member marched up to the front of the sanctuary and began to pray in a loud and proud voice. Thank you, O oh Holy One, that I am not like that scammer back there, preying on the vulnerable, lying, conning, and stealing their money. I worship you regularly each and every Sunday. I volunteer my time to church projects and justice work. I support the budget generously. I can always be counted on to help. The scammer who stood at the back of the church began to weep and rock back and forth as their prayer of grief and remorse burst forth from them. O oh, arbiter of grace, I am a dreadful sinner. My life is not what you hoped for me. I am a crook a thief, scum of the earth. Everything everyone says about me, I throw myself on your mercy. Now I ask you, which one of these leaves this place in right relationship with God? I participate regularly in a Zoom group with some former classmates, now colleagues, to reflect on upcoming scripture passages. We were trying to think of the most accurate contemporary comparison to the tax collector, and we hit upon the idea of scammers. All of us have encountered them in some form or another. More of us than we would care to admit have fallen for these in some form or another. We don't talk about it because it's embarrassing. Sometimes it's as simple as that phone call pretending to be someone from Revenue Canada. Maybe it's more elaborate, trying to convince you they are someone you know who has fallen on hard times. Then there are those who have made a lifetime of conning. The other week, on the new documentary show on CBC Radio called Hell of a Story, I'm just quoting, I listened to The Long Con about Bridget Clarou who spent years posing as a nurse, a teacher, a beauty salon owner, leaving a trail of people feeling violated, endangered, and scammed by her lies. I would say scammers are pretty much universally despised. Jesus' parables could be very shocking, but sometimes that's lost as they are retold in a very different cultural context. We don't always fully understand ethnic and religious hatred between Jews and Samaritans that would offend Jesus' listeners to hear talk of good Samaritans. 
We're not familiar with the honor-shame culture in the ancient world to be able to truly recognize the deep offense the prodigal had committed against his father and family. When we play scammer as a descriptor where tax collector was in the original story, we get the full punch of the story. The tax system in Rome worked like this. The empire was broken down into regions and it was assessed taxes. A chief tax collector like Zacchaeus would actually outright purchase the right to collect, collect taxes in a region. They would have to pay the total amount up front. So chief tax collectors likely came from wealth in order to be able to do that. These regional heads would employ others to actually do the work of collecting. Now likely the tax collector in this story was one of those low-level collectors, the ones responsible for getting the money. Rome only cared that they got their amount. What the, what the tax collectors did besides that was of no matter to them. In order to turn a profit, starting with the chief tax collector all the way down to those on the street, everyone would take their own cut, increasing the burden and indignity for the people in the region. So in, and in addition to being despised as crooks and collecting taxes for the occupiers, they were also considered traitors. The second person praying was scum. Now on the other hand, we tend to have a distorted image of the Pharisees because they were set up to be foils for Jesus. But if we look at the reality behind the Gospels, we would most likely find them to be the counterpart to our lives. They were good, faithful people trying to live to the best of their ability in response to God. The reality is, while we might not put that particular faithful person in charge of pastoral care, folks like this person have always been the bedrock of our faith communities. The tax collector didn't have to be told they were scum. It was pretty obvious from their words they knew what they were. But perhaps they were also somewhat a victim of their circumstance. Charles McCullough, a theologian and sculptor, in his book, The Art of Parables, sees both the Pharisee and the tax collector as cogs in larger, unjust economic systems of the day. The Pharisee, through their tithing, supported the corrupt temple system, and the tax collector serving the oppressive Roman regime. The tax collector, as I said, was pretty small potatoes, just doing this job, because maybe that's the only thing they could do to put food on the table. Their theft was not done to become richer, but to survive. It was only when he got to the chief tax collectors like Zacchaeus, where the graft actually brought wealth. I imagine for the most part in well-orchestrated scams, the person truly benefiting from stealing our money is not the person on the other end of the phone, but the organization or person behind the scenes and running it. I also think the faithful person here was supporting the work of the temple organization in good faith. They were trusting their offering was doing God's good work, care and compassion in the world. But we are reminded our prayers and our actions sometimes support systems and worldviews we do not intend. It can be interpreted as a warning about whom and what we serve. But today we're going to focus on the content of the prayers and the prayers in question. At first glance, the seemingly obvious meaning of this passage is be like the tax collector, not like the Pharisee. There may be truth in this, but when we read it this way, we simply invert the story, and it becomes us praying, thank you, God, for not making me like that smug and arrogant Pharisee over there, right back where the story started. 
I gave proper context for understanding the tax collector, but we, we need to dig a little deeper into the Pharisee and this prayer. As I said earlier, the picture of Pharisees comes to us from the perspective of the Gospel writers looking back with disdain upon a tradition that though originally gave birth to the way of Jesus, early on became a rival faith tradition. To actually get the truest perspective on Pharisaic Judaism from Scripture, we would actually look at Paul's letters, because he was a Pharisee. He drops hints about his former tradition, and actually when he speaks about his life before his calling to be apostle to the Gentiles, his words actually sound like the Pharisee. He, he points out how great his faith life was. So it might have actually been a style of Jewish prayer. Furthermore, one's life as part of the covenant was judged on living out the commandments. From that perspective, this prayer is correct. The Pharisee is living a life in faithfulness to the commands. Well, the tax collector is not. He's breaking one of the big ten, thou shalt not steal, as well as likely many of the other detailed commands in the 613 that are in the Hebrew Bible. Interpreting a prayer of someone from another tradition might not be exactly fair, because we can't really judge their prayer by our standards. Since this story is being told through the lens of Christian interpretation, it would be more accurate to once again imagine this prayer coming from a person active in Christian tradition. Jesus talks about who is justified. The term justification has historically been of great importance within the Christian tradition. It's a term that seemed to originate with Paul when speaking about the relationship between God and non-Jews. At its most basic definition, justification is how we are made right with God. However we might interpret how it happens, in the words of the Apostle Paul, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. Our lives begin in the deep love and bright hope of God. But through the journey, we find ourselves bruised and broken to varying degrees. Through individual cruelty of others, acting out of their own broken places, and through unjust and sometimes evil structures. We add to that our mistakes and missteps coming from our broken places, and the ways that we benefit from the structures. And God's love is often forgotten, and God's hope for us unrealized. It, it seems like there's a chasm between ourselves and God, and fear of what will result if we can't make it to the other side. The prayers offered actually both come from that understanding though they are expressed very differently, based upon different life experiences. They both come from a place of believing the gap between God and ourselves is unbelievably wide due to our brokenness and mistakes. But what Jesus is trying to tell us throughout his ministry is that we are loved by God, and God continues to hold deep hope for us and for the world, no matter how often that hope is disappointed and even thwarted. We don't have to be made right with God. That is already our reality. We just have to believe it. I know traditional theology proclaims we need the cross to put us in that position. Our sinfulness and God's holiness can only be bridged by Jesus' blood. But I think the cross is more about God identifying with suffering, exposing injustice, and revealing the truth that love is stronger than anything that it might come up against. The cross helps us understand and accept the gifts of love and grace that were already there. But come on, 
back to that prayer by the religious person. This doesn't seem to be the prayer of someone who doubts their standing with God. But have you ever met those people, the ones who are always the hero or heroine in every story they tell about themselves? We call them arrogant, but if we dig deeper into their story, we usually find these great exploits are covering up insecurity, feeling not good enough. I think this is a prayer of someone who believes God's love is limited, so they need to prove their credentials. These are all the things that I do for you, God. Surely that will make me acceptable. Furthermore, operating out of the scarcity model, where God's love is limited to only some, they need to show themselves to be more qualified than the next person. Have you ever heard this wisdom? If you and someone else are running away from a bear, you don't have to be faster than the bear, just the other person. If there are only a limited number of spots in heaven, you just have to be better than the other person. Sometimes we romanticize the tax collector and others like him. You know, they, they just knew God better. The old spirituality versus religion dichotomy. But the truth is, the tax collector and others like him we're more open to Jesus' promise of God's grace and love because, let's face it, the traditional understanding of that God's love was limited does not work for them. The tax collector has no hope in hell, pun intended, of having a better faith resume than this person of faith. So they throw themselves on God's mercy, discovering that love has been there all along and their life is transformed as a result. We see it in other places. The tax collector Levi becomes a disciple of Jesus. Zacchaeus makes restoration and beyond and begins to use his wealth to upend the economic system. The prodigal comes home and resumes relationship with and care of his father. The challenge for Jesus' opponents is to acknowledge they are operating under a misguided system as well, and to let go of trying to prove their worthiness, which ends up distancing them from God's true nature and way, misunderstanding Jesus' life and ministry, and participating in the continuation of a world run by powers and principalities that break hearts damage lives, and perpetuate unjust structures, and misinterpret Jesus' life and message. I don't think we're meant to identify with one of them or the other, but instead we're to be inspired, to be part of upending a religious tradition founded in fear, judgment, and exclusion, proclaiming instead that Jesus' message is that we are loved, beyond our wildest imaginations. We are invited into healing and wholeness for ourselves and care and compassion for others. Our mission and ministry are to be understood as a response to the love of God, not as a way to earn a spot in heaven. When we approach it in that way, then I truly believe we are not only finding peace for ourselves, but our actions become part of what tears down injustice in the world and makes space for God's new order. Thanks be to God. Amen.
and give thanks to our God, the Holy One, who responds to our prayers, offers mercy for our broken places, and is the hope of all. In thanks for these gifts and the gifts of being formed into Christ's body, to be strength to each other and love for the world, we are invited to generosity this day and every day. There are many ways to support the work of God through our, through our donation boxes, online, and also mail to the church office. My friends, let us bring our prayers for our world. Gracious God, in this time, we offer our gratitude for the width of your care, the breadth of your grace, and for the promise that we are all included in your love. We are grateful for Jesus who came to model how to live as faithful people, compassionate, generous, kind, and who reminds us that even when we mess up, there's always a way back home. As a people formed by grace and commission to care, we bring our prayers for this world of yours. We pray that where there is war, violence, oppression, that these might come to an end to be replaced with a just peace, safety and security, equality and dignity for all. We pray this day for the people of Ukraine, for those protesting government-sanctioned violence in Iran. Where there is poverty, addiction, trauma, we pray for healing and wholeness, for a just and equal sharing of the world's resources, and for relief. We pray for the Church, that we welcome all who come to experience your love. We pray for the faithful who do the hard work of serving without seeking recognition, but simply because you have called us to follow in Jesus' way. We lift up this day the ministry of the United Church in East Central Ontario and Eastern Ontario, Ottawa regions. In our region, we pray for Nanette and for the Emo Devlin pastoral charges. We pray for people of faith and goodwill in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Panama, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. We pray for those known to us and known to you who have received an unwelcome diagnosis, who are struggling with health issues of any kind, who are grieving a loss, fearing the unknown future, are lost, alone, and lonely, who might be facing that final journey into your eternal love. We pray for comfort, for strength, for release, and for trust in your love. We lift up their names in our hearts to you. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, which carries with it the power to restore us to the fullness of our being and the wholeness for the world. Amen. Our final hymn is Lord Jesus, you shall be my song.
God to guide and support us. May we open our hearts to God's presence and our lives to God's purpose, living each day with hope and thanksgiving. And our Amen, our choral blessing, is number 298 in uh, your red books. And when you walk from here, and we're going to sing it together twice. Thank you. 